Hello and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly and I am your host. And in this partnership, I'm definitely the Thelma. And I'm Matt Freeman and uh, I guess that makes me the Louise. Yeah, remember when you killed that guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This week on the show, Deconstructing Ridley Scott, our 26-part series looking at all the movies of director and uh, and knight Sir Ridley Scott, uh, <laughs> continues with the director's seventh film and the first film in our beloved time period that we like to call the 1990s, which uh, I believe you said the other day is only like five years ago, right? Um, yeah, the 1990s is only about five to ten years ago. Yeah, seems reasonable. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about 1991's Thelma and Louise. Then, Matt, I want to talk to you about Star Wars again. I can't um, imagine why, but okay. <laughs> so we're going to wrap up the episode talking about Star Wars because there was a new interview with Kathleen Kennedy in Vanity Fair, and it brought up some interesting things that I think are, are worth, worth uh, perusing in the world of Star Wars. I can't wait to hear about it. I can't tell if you're being serious or not. <laughs> Legitimately. You, you know, this is a, a rare instance when I haven't already heard the Star Wars news. So, Oh, that's um, okay. Also, I, I'm totally distracted now because you made that joke about Sir Ridley Scott. And now now I'm thinking we, sh- we need to do a podcast series called Knights of the Silver Screen, where it's just about all of the Hollywood people who have been knighted. Ooh. And that's Hollywood. just the show directors who have been knighted well, directors or actors oh hollywood um hollywood just Fil- people film people, people. Yeah. <laughs> paul mccartney uh-huh. elton john these are not i guess these are celebrities michael kane okay helen mirren uh-huh a judy it, dench isn't patrick stewart a knight um Is he not? he's gotta be he's gotta be Julie Andrews. Um, he is. He is. Okay. Wait, Bill Gates became an honorary knight. I thought you had to be British. I'm pretty sure you have to be British. That sounds like I a guess honorary show. knighthood is different from actual knighthood. I guess he doesn't get lands and serfs and everything like, like a normal knight. Emma Thompson. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's Okay, on this list, people are like, has Steven Spielberg been knighted? I'm like, no, no, he's American. I'm sorry for this digression. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back to this week's movie, which is Ridley Scott's Thelma and Louise. Thelma. I'll get it! Thelma, I've not told you I can't stand it when you holler in the morning. I'm sorry, doll. I just didn't want you to be late. Hey, how you doing, little housewife? Louise. Yeah, I still have to ask Daryl if I can go. You mean you haven't asked him yet? Thelma. Is he your husband or your father? Thelma and Louise are going fishing. How come Daryl let you go? Because I didn't ask him. <laughs> He's going to tell you. I left him a note. <laughs> Thelma and Louise are going to catch hell. I'll have a wild turkey straight up and a coke back, please. Thelma. Oh, what? Tell me something. Is this my vacation or isn't it? Matt, what is this movie all about? Two best friends set out on an adventure, but it soon turns around to a terrifying escape from being hunted by the police as these two girls escape for the crimes they committed. <laughs> Yet again, just just <laughs> gold star summary. I cannot is believe that- a movie this well-known and beloved has that IMDb summary. I don't even think – I don't even know if that's grammatically – it's not. It's amazing. It, it also has the word escape in it twice. And the, these two girls, these two best friends, two girls. Okay. This movie was written by Callie Corey, directed, of course, by Sir Ridley Scott, and stars Susan Sarandon, Gina Davis, and Harvey Keitel, as well as a, a very young and very shirtless Brad Pitt. Oh, yes. <laughs> Matt. I got to know, what did you think of Thelma and Louise? Had you seen this film before? I guess I'll ask that first. So, yeah, this is one of those ones that has that I have always managed to not see, despite it being one of those classics that everybody has to see. Uh, so mm-hmm. this is the first time that I've watched it. OK, what do you think? And, um, I mean, I see why it's a classic. It's <laughs> it's it's very, very well put together. Like it, it's one of those movies that definitely has a thesis that it's supposed to leave you with and it's supposed to leave, you know, you're supposed to walk out having you know thinking about it and processing it and reflecting on your own life and i think it, it worked on me in that way 
also it's very funny it's very entertaining the acting is incredible there's so many really just perfect moments of acting um and and then overall i think it's just a, just a well done it's a well done movie and and it's well directed which is of course why yeah. we're all here what yeah. did you think I, well you know i i was i was worried because the last three movies i have not enjoyed very well very much at all and i was worried about about our boy ridley and i was like uh oh is it going to be until gladiator where i have something good to say i had seen this movie before i remembered liking it but i was a little nervous about how it was going to i was going to hold up on this viewing and uh, I love this movie. I think this might be the best movie of his we've covered so far. That's right. I think I think it might be better than Alien, Matt. Um, oh, I think this movie, and, and like it's such a it's such a, a sigh of relief I had here. Like, oh look, it's a good script. A, a good script. Look how look uh. how far a movie can go with a good script. And um, yeah, like you said, Ridley Scott, I think directs the shit out of this movie. I, there's so much, so many choices that he makes throughout the course of this movie that I really want to talk about. Um, I think it's it's so wonderful to look at. I agree with you about the performances. Um, and yeah, the script is wonderful. Um, what a story. I mean, basically what this movie is, is, is the the quintessential American road trip movie, except the big difference is here. It's two women, which, you know, in 1991 and still even now, 30 years later, I think is something you just don't tend to see very often. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I mean, it's it's incredibly feminist i guess yeah is, oh yeah is, is the like that's almost like saying aliens is about an alien it's like yeah that's <laughs> that, that is what the movie is it, it's this very kind of shocking uh, upsetting you know depiction of the really awful just situations that women find themselves in which you know as a man you kind of have heard stories but you don't really know and then the movie mm -hmm. just subjects you to every you know in a in a pretty rapid fire fashion it's it's just like the the constant like ogling and harassment and catcalling and manipulation and outright assault yeah. and and then knowing that that the establishment doesn't have your side even though you were the one who was wronged and you're just like and then like just like every man okay this is, this is one one thought that i had while watching or maybe maybe shortly after watching was like every man in this movie is a total piece of trash <laughs> in, in like and and usually in like different interesting ways yeah and, and then i was like well not a hundred percent because harvey Keitel is not a piece yep. of trash and that's it's like, what i was about to say and the thing is the movie that's what that's the clever thing the movie has done it gives you one man in the movie so that you can actually as a man <laughs> watching the movie <laughs> anchor and be like okay well I, i'm not like these guys i'm i would be like that guy whether or not that's true that's what you tell yourself sure um, well and the yeah. thing i love the most about it is yes he's the only quote-unquote good man in this story but he's powerless right yes. and, and i think one of the points is that even even the good ones are as powerless against the system as as the women are in it like exactly like he like the the patriarchy that we can call every position of power in this movie because i think that's what it, it is definitively trying to do is unbeatable the women cannot beat it even the good men cannot beat it nobody can beat it and and so that's why the the final moment of this movie which has become the iconic sequence of them you know jumping the car into the grand canyon is tragic and and empowering at the same time you know like I, it's this movie left me feeling a lot of complicated emotions actually so so it left me feeling mostly just sad like it, it there's um i can't think of another example unfortunately right now but like I, I think there's a great storytelling trick that you can do where you can get away with an extreme bummer ending if you shoot it in a certain way and have the right music <laughs> playing sure and then you walk out of the movie not being like fuck that movie um but instead being le like like kind of feeling a mixture of bittersweetness and then the fact of the matter is that it was a sad ending because they killed themselves rather than being caught yeah like it's a super it's it's like this is the way the world is these women they they, they basically knew from the moment that you know one of them made a a mistake that there was kind of not going to be any coming back from it and and they destroy themselves rather than allow themselves to be captured by the system like super super horrible but yeah. they made it a little bit palatable i mean literally this is really scott just being like okay we can't end the movie 
with them graphically crashing their car and dying. So like we're going to cut, we're going to have happy, wistful music, and then we're going to cut and we're going to show, this is really brilliant, by the way, we're going to cut to showing like a montage of them being happy together. Yeah. And it kind of makes you temporarily forget the fact that they just died. Well, and they just freeze frame the car in the air, right? Yeah, so we, right. we see it we see it jump off the, the cliff and fly through the air and then we stop. So we don't have to see the fall right. and the explosion and the death. We just see the moment of this choice, which is I choose my own fate. And and you're right. The, the way the music swells, the slow motion, you know, the, the, the one good man running after them, trying to stop them, trying to reason with them and none of it works. It is shot to be empowering, I think. And I, and I do think, you know, it is to kind of make it so you don't leave the movie with a complete bad taste in your mouth. But I also think it's, it's challenging you a little bit because I think you're right. Like this is shot as an empowering, like we're going to keep going. We're not going to let these people stop us. We're, we, we are going to choose how we go out and what we're going to do. You can't rein us in. You can't mm-hmm. stop us. But yeah, it's also, it, it is also literally saying it is impossible for us to live in this system. We cannot beat it. We cannot flee from it. It will find us. And so the only recourse is to just die. And that is incredibly depressing. And I think it wants to challenge you. It wants to make you feel good about this and then have that sneaking feeling underneath it going, oh, wait, no, that's that's bad, actually. <laughs> that's yeah. awful. That's terrible that these two women who – before the start of, of the events of this movie had really never done anything wrong in their life. They just were living their lives and, and, were, and it's just like this, this constant getting screwed over by everyone around them. And yet they are seen as the bad ones. The enemy is the ones that must be stopped. Um, it's really fascinating because when you look at when this movie came out, the reaction that, that people had to it, I guess, I guess not too surprising, but there were a lot of people very, very angry about this movie to the point where everyone involved in making it were like, I don't understand why y'all are so mad. Uh-huh. And and it's it's because like well, why are you why are you showing these these women all they're doing is is bad things. They're doing crimes and you're glorifying the crimes that they're doing. And it's like, "Oh, see we got you." Like we we uh-huh. we got you. Like it's the same thing if you watch Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing where people come out of it going like, "Well, why did he why did he throw the chair through the plate glass window? That's he didn't do the right thing. And I was going, Oh yeah. Why are you talking about the one bad thing he did and not <laughs> all the other bad things that everyone else did? That's the trick of the movie. It, it gets you in that. And, and I think that's exactly what this movie did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also I, I think there, you know, a lot of men are likely offended by the depiction of men sure, in the movie. Sure, like, yeah. like that, that's another, yeah, I, I think, I think the mo- the movie is, is definitely aimed to be a provocative, you know, attack on the status quo. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, and, and I can see being upset by it. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it wants to upset you <laughs> in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. And and I do think it's interesting the way in which the movie, like if, if you, if you allow it to lull, to lull you into it, there are moments where like, I don't know, maybe this is just me speaking, but there are moments where I got really frustrated with Thelma because I'm just like Thelma, you idiot. Like, of course, this man's going to take advantage of you. And like, it it, it gets to the point where you kind of start to want to push blame onto her, like, especially with the whole Brad Pitt part, right? Where like, Uh this, like the second he shows up at her hotel door, I'm like, fuck, he's going to rob her. And then like, you're going through and then he starts talking about he's a bank robber. and I'm like, fuck, he's going to rob her. (laughs) And like, it goes through this whole thing. And you just want to be like, Thelma, you idiot. And I think that's kind of Louise's reaction to it as well at the beginning. And like, because of because of the way she initially gets frustrated and then just kind of gets over it and is like, we just need to learn that this is what it takes to live in this world, which again is, is very depressing. Yeah. I think it allows you to both experience that frustration and then the movie calls you out on it in a way that makes you go, Oh yeah, I shouldn't, I'm blaming, I'm blaming the victim here. I shouldn't be doing that. There's only so many times you can watch Thelma kind of get literally and metaphorically punched in the face by the world before you're like, maybe it's not her fault. Maybe the world sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I agree that like Louise is, um, there's a thread throughout the whole movie of Louise kind of treating her like she's dumb and, yeah. and, and being like, you know, can you shut it and just sit like, like speaking to her very rudely and dismissively and, and getting really angry and annoyed with her when she does these things. But I think, I think, there is a and it's very subtle like none of none of this is like shoved in your face so you you kind of have to think and and look for it but i think there is a a a point in the movie when there's a reversal where 
she starts to see Thelma as someone that she has something to learn from as well. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure what m- moment that is. It might be roughly around when she robs the convenience store. I think, I think the moment where the dynamic truly shifts is when they, uh, when she pulls the gun on the cop and throws him in the back of the trunk. Mm, okay. But I mean, I think you're, I think yeah. you're right. W- when she robs the store is when we're starting to see that shift. But even yeah. that, the movie plays that off of her kind of being like yeah. dumb and aloof right. in a way that, oh, I thought I could just get away with this. And, and yeah. like, cause I mean, like, I think the movie does an excellent job at this, by the way, because the way Ridley Scott introduces us to these two characters is, you know, first we see them basically at their jobs, right? We see Susan Sarandas Luis at the diner being a waitress. We see uh, Gina Davis's Thelma at home because she's, she's a homemaker. Um, and Thelma's house is a mess. Like there's stuff everywhere. She's just a much less organized person. Uh-huh. Um, and then I think this pl- pays off really well when it shows the two of them pack and Luis is like packing, like everything's folded and fitting perfectly. And Thelma's just like yanking stuff off the shelf and throwing stuff in her bags and like, squ- like squishing it in there. It's this perfect way of, of before the characters have even interacted with each other directly, defining their base character model, you know, like yeah. this is like Thelma's a little bit more aloof. Um, Luis is, is much more careful and and considered and calculated. Yeah. Um, and that's just the, the way their dynamic works. And and it shows us that instead of telling us about it. Absolutely. And, and, and just, I have to say the performances on both of them, part of me wants to say like, especially Susan Sarandon, but Gina Davis also is amazing. So I guess mm-hmm. just, just both of them are just so much of the character of, of each of them is just oozing through the performance. Like there's so, so much like microscopic, you know, work being done with expressions yeah. and just like like glances and and lengths of pauses by by Susan Sarandon specifically, but I think it comes through with her in that way because her character is this reserved person who has who's sort of scarred by her past, and so every yeah. like every reaction is like filtered through this cynicism and and and, and suspicion, um, and wh- whereas yeah, where, whereas Gina Davis is is almost the opposite arc. I, I don't know. It's just two, really two fascinating characters, two incredible performances. Like that's, again, you know, Ridley Scott plus these amazing actors plus everything else going right with this movie. Um, there's, there's really nothing to complain about. No, I, I have I have no single moment in this movie that I did not like. Uh, and I, I the performances, I agree with you. They're so good. And I think the thing that really elevates the performances is Ridley Scott's camera work because he 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 pulls in on these women a lot like there a lot of this movie are close-ups of them talking you know and so their face is filling the screen and and so that we can see every little tick like so much of this movie a huge percentage of this movie is just them in the car with a camera kind of over the the rear view mirror on the left hand side just like looking at them as they're talking to each other and it's it's like right up in their face it's very intimate like we're just always right there with them and i think that allows the performances to really 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 shine mm-hmm. yeah yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Both of these women were nominated for Academy Awards for this movie um, for lead actress, both of them. Uh, unfortunately, they lost to uh, Jodie Foster for Silence of the Lambs. But Oh, yeah. This was the year that 49 of the best movies ever came out. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, this movie did also win um, the original screenplay Oscar, uh, not director. I, I, it, it annoys me. That they, I think it was Silence of the Lambs that won for a director, though, which also, yes, very good movie. It's just, it's just unfortunate that like so many good movies happened all at the same time. So, uh, yeah, this movie was never honored in the way it should be. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, I love these characters. I love all the side characters as well. Uh, they're two husbands slash boyfriend in, um, um, Michael Madsen playing Luis's boyfriend and then, um, Christopher McDonald playing Daryl, who is Thelma's <laughs> husband, who is incredible. Uh, like he's a cartoon, right? Like that's yeah. a, the, the fascinating thing about this movie, I think, is that it is very serious. Like the, the, a woman is raped. Um, they die at the end. It, it's but it's also very, very funny, too. And I think that yes. it's, it's this perfect blend of the two of those things. Well, that's yeah. And that's the great part about his performance. It's one of those really rare performances where I feel like it 
perfectly dances that line between comic and just he's he just sucks and you hate him because yeah. because yeah. he is funny but it, he's never playing it as like this is a you know this is a, i mean i guess there's a few laughs there, there are a few in the, you know good laughs in the movie like i think oh, yeah. my, my favorite is is you know women love that shit and then they all laugh and, and it's it's like dude, these are just idiots they're all just so so <laughs> dumb and they don't understand anything about the situation that they've created with their own stupidity. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite Daryl scene is when all the cops are sitting in um, the, the, his, I guess his bed, his house, right? Like uh-huh. they're waiting for Thelma to call and they're all watching a, like a, a romance movie on TV. I don't, yeah. I, I didn't catch what movie it was, but like he switches it to a, a, a baseball game, I uh-huh. guess. Yeah. And like every single cop just like, glares at him until he switches back yeah it's so hilarious to me because like i i think one of the things it's also trying to do is is challenge the idea of masculinity in that like these are all men every single one of them in this room is a man and they're watching they're not they don't want to watch the sports they want to watch the romance novel or movie whatever yeah so so they got hooked on the story and but they're not supposed to admit that and and yet he and yet this specific guy he doesn't give a shit about that he's totally unromantic he just wants to watch his sports he's um he's awful (laughs) he's the worst and yet and yet Here's the thing that I think is really interesting. This movie does. The last shot in the movie we see of him is when basically everyone has realized that Thelma and Louise are fucked, right? That they're yeah. going to kill him. Yeah. Um, and it, it cuts to him sitting at his kitchen table, I think watching the news on TV and he's like destroyed. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, he's, he's totally, yeah. yeah. Like he's totally distraught this is a woman that he has shown absolutely no interest in his, the entire time we've seen him in the movie, like to the point where he's so mean to her that when he answers the phone happily, (laughs) she immediately knows the cops are with him. Uh huh. Um, and yet, and yet we do uh, that. We do get this, this time to, to see this scene where he's destroyed. Yeah. And, and I, I wonder like, I guess what was your take on that? Because I think it, 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 it humanizes him a little bit. He's not a good person. He doesn't deserve her. He's, he's bad, but he's also still a person and he's realized now that he's going to lose the woman he married. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think, um, I, I think you can empathize with somebody realizing that their life's never going to be the same, that their life's not going to be the way they thought it was going to go. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think that he's the kind of person who actually didn't realize he had a bad marriage. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I, I think, and, and, and this is another statement about like the culture of, of the way, I, I don't know what word to use for it, just the, the way, the way the culture is, is like uh, a boy can be raised in a, in a household and think that that is the way that you treat a woman and think mm-hmm. that, uh, think that that is what a marriage looks like. And then he grows up and finds a woman who he genuinely thinks is really cool and his his programmed in strategy for how to how to to make a life with her is to treat her like she's a a, a dog um and uh and, and just be awful to her and he doesn't know any other way to be now mm-hmm. you could you could view that as like oh matt you're letting the abuser off the hook and, and i'm like i i just think the movie is going for a little bit more complexity i, I yeah. think i think it's asking you to imagine like he, he is he is distraught because his life is his life is ruined like it's it's it sucks for him yeah it's also true that he's an asshole <laughs> both, yeah. both, both yeah. things you know i agree both can be, can be true yeah. and i think you're absolutely right there that you know i think one of the points the movie is making is he is completely unable to recognize that it's a bad marriage and that he was maybe not good in it and that he actually maybe loved her and should have treated her better until she's gone, yeah. like literally gone dead. I like um, that. He, he's completely unable to process that at all until that point, because like at no point at all in the rest of the movie, does he even come close to processing that? Yeah. I, I want to talk about um, Michael Madsen's character though, because I think the movie's doing something really complicated with him too, uh-huh. because at, at first he seems like he's going to be like one of the the good ones, right? Um, but he he yeah. he, fo- he he lies. He said, you know, no matter what they say to me, I'm not going to tell them I saw you. I'm not going to tell them like. But he ends up telling everything to the cops. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I'm not sure. You know, 
I, I think that I think that that is honestly because she rejected him or because yeah. she didn't re- react the way that he wanted. Like, I, I think that there's a thread with his character and with other men where with um, Thelma's husband, where where it's like the man, or a lot of men, I think, get a huge amount of their validation as, as a human being and as a man and as whatever of their identity from the way that women treat them. Mm-hmm. Like, like one thing Louise says is, is that, you know, he, he loves the chase or something like that. And it, and it's almost like the reason he's interested in her is that she's resistant. Mm-hmm. And it, and that's kind of an, that, that's like an interesting kind of like, well, I, I don't, I don't want to just say that that's toxic because first of all, that's kind of a flattening way to look <laughs> at it. But, but it de- definitely, I think the movie's asking you to, to think about like, well, is it good? Is it good to be the guy who's always pursuing the woman who, who is always running away like that? Like, t- take a hint, man. Yeah. Seems like she's not interested. But but then I think there is a certain type of person who is only attracted to women who are trying to run away. So I, yeah, I don't know. That was it. It's, yeah. I, I'm not really sure what what they're saying with his character. I, I I do think it has something to do with the validation angle. I agree, and and I think um. It, uh, he, I mean, the whole the whole concept of him proposing to her is just ludicrous, right? And the movie recognizes it as ludicrous because I think he says something to the effect of, "Well, isn't that what you want?" Like he doesn't want to get married. Mm-hmm. He just he just knows she she does. And I, and I think that is a commentary on how many people out there join marriages because that's like what's expected of them, or is that like there's this hilarious cultural thing that we do where men don't really care about marriage and women and they women want to get married, men don't, but they do it for their wife for their girlfriends you know Mm -hmm. and it's hilarious and i don't think it's true in 99 percent of the cases and i think the cases that it is true is the guy's just pretending that because he knows that that's what the culture says like what what jet like what i'm supposed to do i'm supposed to be the one that's indifferent towards the marriage i'm supposed to be this because i'm because i'm the guy it's the it's that's a that's a girl thing to care about this kind of stuff um and he's and Obviously, he has it for her real bad, <laughs> yeah. and he's desperate to have her. And and but he tries to come off as like, well, isn't that what isn't that what you wanted? Here's this ring. I got you this. Yeah, I got you this thing. Don't you want right. it? It's not a big deal. I just spent yeah. pro- probably you know a paycheck on this on this mm-hmm. ring. No big deal. You know. Oh yeah, I'll I'll loan you like what was it like se- several thousand dollars? Yeah, like uh, six and a half grand. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can pay me back later. No big deal. And then it, yeah, like I, I agree. That, that's that's a perfect observation actually that like he's clearly completely in love with her but and and i think even you know this is another one of those kind of screwed up things is like he he there's like a flash of anger we see from him mm-hmm. when when he when she kind of responds to him coldly and you can you can kind of see him thinking like man like i put in all this effort to help and like she's still treating me like shit and he and he like smashes some stuff off the table. Yeah. And and he, and he immediately gets control over himself and it's like fine after that. But like I think that was meant to communicate like he's he's he cares so much about this and it really hurts him that she doesn't. And that was his one moment of like expressing that. But like he can't he can't say to her you know, it really hurts me how little you seem to care about me. He, yeah. So he, he has to smash stuff, right? Like that's yeah. that's more of the of the toxicity. And I guess I, I don't want to be unfair to that character, but part of me believes he he could have been violent with her mm-hmm. if he thought he would get away with it. Like like a person like with the way Thelma is at the beginning of this movie, like you, uh, her husband thinks he can get away with treating her like shit. Mm-hmm. Um Luis is the type of person that will not let you get away with that. Right. She's just like, she's been because she's been through it before and she's kind of closed herself off to those connections in order to avoid that ever happening again. And so like he gets mad and, and throws shit and is about to go violent and then kind of recognizes that, Oh, she's not going to let me do that. And so if I actually want, like if I, my tactic for this one has to be to be aloof actually and yeah. and i think michael latson is the perfect guy to play that role actually because he's like the perfect like like you know kind of indifferent quiet uninterested type of actor i think he's just like it just it just works perfectly yeah yeah this is a i you know i've I, i've it's not that I think Michael Madsen is bad, certainly, but but he he usually is doing a very specific thing, and I felt like this was a movie where 
he was doing some more kind of nuanced and interesting things than I usually see from him. So, yeah, um, he, he's one of those um, he's one of those actors that I think has a really good presence, mm-hmm. but I think typically does not deliver dialogue in the best way, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Um, his, his dialogue delivery delivery can be very flat, but I do think I do think you're right that, you know, he's he's projecting a lot. There's a lot going on under the surface with him that we've talked about here in the last couple of minutes. And yeah, um, I, I think, I think that is a testament to his skills as an actor where, you know, maybe he, maybe his dialogue reads aren't the best, but he, he's able to express in yeah. really interesting ways. And I really, you know, I, I feel like I want to give some credit to Ridley Scott for this because sure. when and not, and by this, I kind of mean not just Michael Madsen, but sort of all the performances, because we talked before about the idea that, when Ridley Scott gets a really good script and there's a really solid emotional through line and there's a lot of complexity to the characters that always comes through. Now, when the script is garbage, it doesn't come through because there's nothing there to come through. But, <laughs> but when he has good material, it comes through. And I think, I, I think he is kind of cra- you know, crafting these scenes and, and helping the actors understand like, okay, this, you know, you know, somebody's got to be behind the camera saying all right this is the point of the scene this is what we're doing with this scene mm-hmm. you know this is this is where this character is coming from and there really is a uh, you know a, a sense of of continuity scene to scene of like what we're saying with the story you know yeah um so i, no, I really you know i think it's being driven by a very competent hand and, I, and I, yeah no i totally agree i mean this is the guy who a week ago i called Oh, Ridley the robots back. And mm-hmm. this is the most emotionally powerful and affecting movies I've watched in a long time. Right. Like the, just the, the way, the way we d- depict these two women and, and the emotional turmoil they're going through and the way he manages to capture that, I think is wonderful. Um, and yeah, it is a testament to the actors he's working with, which are all time classic actors, but I, I, you have to give him some credit for sure. I mean, I, I, I find the sequence when they're near the end of the movie, when they're in the car, and Thelma is replaying the murder mm-hmm. uh, over in her head and laughing about it. Yeah. That is a fantastic scene. Yeah. Because she's laughing, but she's also crying a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, Gene Davis is playing that really well. Uh, Susan Saranda is playing that really well. And the camera is managing, it's doing this really fascinating thing, how it's cutting and how it's shifting from the 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 wider shot with the two of them in it to cutting between individual shots of the two of them so we can uh, be allowed to see that A, this is making Louise very, very uncomfortable that she's laughing about it. And B, we can kind of see that the only reason Thelma's laughing about it is because she's trying to hold off from crying about it because it's an incredibly awful, terrible thing that happened to her. And, and despite the guy being a total jackass, like it, it's incredibly traumatic to have murdered someone as well. Yeah. I just, I just like everything is, everything's clicking in this movie. Just yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. That, that, that was a great moment. Um, just so many, so many great moments, even, even just little, little quiet moments. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense just to to briefly tap on on what we were just saying about the, the script mattering so much. It's kind of obvious. Like, if, if you know, not that not that I'm a director at all, but like, if you give me a really solid script that has a solid story, and you understand what's supposed to be happening in every scene, and it's deep and it's layered, and the characters are rich, then like, in a sense, it's it's much easier to just like make a good movie out of that. If if it's just a very boring, thin. Uh, you know, um, tropey script, then, mm-hmm. then the mo- the best you can do is just kind of hope that your actors find something to latch onto, but you can't pull something out of it that isn't there. Yeah. Um, but I think you're right, but he absolutely does find like every angle that there is to be found when the script is really solid. <laughs> you're right. And, and I think one of the things that this script does, and one of the things he recognizes in it is I think it's one of those movies that succeeds because it layers this complicated story on top of a very standard trope filled type of film. Like, like I said at the beginning, this is the American road picture. Like this, this particular story has been made a hundred times before, you know, two people go on the road, uh, they go through trials and tribulations while on the road and they find themselves by the end of the movie, right? Like this is a pretty standard archetypal story. And and because we have comfort in the understanding of this pretty standard archetypal story, we can build nuance onto that. We can add things onto a good, solid, st- 
bridge structure and then we can add complications to it add different things focus on different ideas pull out different metaphors you know really dive deep into the central thesis of the film because we have this solid solid base of this is a road picture we know what these movies are um and and i think that's one of the places it succeeds and i think you know i think a lot of other writers and directors should take lessons from that that like you can do complicated things in a movie with a relatively simple structure yeah that's a good point yeah it, it's it's one of those I, that's that's a yeah it's an interesting point because it's like in terms of in, in terms of like the premise the premise is actually i would say pretty fresh and original but the premise and and the the like sort of genre structure the premise is being imposed on to or two to or two different things yeah um no, I mean, the premise just, 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 I mean, like I said, just the fact that it's two women, yeah. the premise automatically becomes fresh and new because it's just not the type of thing that has been done very often. There's been so many road pictures that have either been two men or a man and a woman. Um, just the idea of doing this kind of thing is just not, uh, it's, it's not done very often and it's still not done very often. Like there, there are plenty of movies that copied this movie after it, but it's not like this is the type, this is a pretty standard type of movie we see these days. Yeah. And I also feel like maybe this is wrong if you actually count it up, but I feel like most movies about fugitives end with the fugitive being exonerated in some way. Hmm. Whereas there's definitely some movies about fugitives that end with the fugitive being murdered or, you know, the cops catch them and kill them or whatever. And it's a, and it's a tragedy, but this is, this is uh, one of the few that I can think of where, you know, your 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 protagonist is is a fugitive from the law and sure they just die sadly in the end sure i mean i i, I compare this to like butch cassidy and the sundance kid or bonnie and clyde are, are the, the closest comparisons to me and i think both of those do not end well for our outlaws um, yeah i guess those are those are the two that i was that i was sort of thinking about where i'm like well there's is is yeah there's maybe one other maybe i'm just totally wrong about this um you know there's the fugitive. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Harrison Ford does get it. spoilers get exonerated. Actually, here here's the rule: if it's one fugitive, he's gonna be fine. If it's two friends who are fugitives, they're dead. You're fucked. Yeah. You're fucked. Yeah. 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 You know what I think? I, I wanted to talk about that friendship though, because one of the things that I find so refreshing about this movie is yes, there is conflict between the two women the the movie never halts itself for that conflict you know like they get mad at each other they get frustrated but it seems to just move on from that you know like there's the moment where where Thelma loses the money right mm -hmm. and in a different movie Louise is just like fuck you I'm going off on my own I'm done with this that never happens um th th just the idea that like it's Louise that decides to shoot this guy right th there's no there's no kind of boiling conflict out of out of Thelma's resentment for Luis getting her into this mess, you know, like it, this comes up in conversation and they deal with it, but it's not, it doesn't become like a plot point ever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, there's something really refreshing about that, that this is just a friendship that is not going to be manipulated or messed with by the story of the movie. It's just the, the, the solid core of this movie is that these are two women that are just, you know, that love each other, that are just best yeah. friends and just, um, you know, just, it doesn't it doesn't matter what they they do or don't or get wrong like that is going to be a solid through line through it no matter what yeah i agree that was that that gives you some kind of ground to stand on and mm -hmm. I, I think it would have felt really cheap if they had done the you know the typical uh you know oh they have a fight and they're not talking and then they yeah. have to amend they have to make amends like the closest thing you get to that is a couple times when louise like snaps at thelma and then thelma kind of is hurt by it and then louise is like okay i shouldn't have said that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah. it well you and know. then there's the one moment where where thelma comes to her and says like you're not gonna you're, you're not gonna like like ditch me right you're not gonna like turn me in or fold on me or anything like that yeah and and louise is just like no it, like so so much to the point where like i was like what what even made her think that louise was gonna do that just because uh -huh. she's talking to the detective on the phone that's it right um it, it's it's like you never believe that that was a possibility ever like these two women are are in it together till the, yeah. the absolute end yeah you know it's funny 
the, the movies I, I feel like we've we've mostly been talking about well we've been we've been roving all around but but <laughs> one moment that i one kind of part of the movie that i think is just stellar is like the immediate aftermath of louise shooting the guy um mm-hmm. and just everything about how that plays out and just the, the way where she she's like you know chain smoking and be like just i have to think okay just we're just gonna we're gonna go to this motel and I'm, i have to think i have to just think okay mm-hmm. and i'm like i don't know i just i thought that was thought that was great um because she's clearly in shock um, yeah but also like she's also capable of like being calculating so i, I don't know i just love that part specifically yeah i mean and, and one of the things like the, the getting even more immediate to the aftermath i love the moment where like she's driving the car and she's like needing to pull over. Right. Mm-hmm. Because she's going to throw up. Yeah. And like, there are just 18 wheelers like everywhere. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, and I know it's part of the reason is because they were near a truck stop, but like every, every place they turn in the movie, there's like this giant fucking 18 wheeler, like hovering over them at all moments. And like, uh-huh. I love that she has to cut one off in order to pull off the road. And then while they're pulled off the road with her puking, another one drives by and honks at her. And that's, I mean, I think that pays off wonderfully in the absolute pig of a man in the, the oiler truck uh-huh. who just like harasses them the, every time he sees them. And I think the 18 wheelers are just this perfect metaphor for like the men in their life that they're just like always there, always hovering, always honking and driving by. No one's stopping to see these two women dark and in the night one like bent over and obviously sick. Like no one even thinks to be like, oh, gee, I wonder if they're okay." No, it's just like, what are you doing? Your your emotions and the, the things that you're feeling and the things that you're going through are getting in the way of what I want. And therefore, I'm going to be annoyed with you. Absolutely. You could totally write an English paper about the trucks, particularly because, (laughs) number one, giant phallus. Yeah. Number two, they blow one of them up (laughs) with their gun and it explodes Um, in a a clear moment of just like that's they've done worse stuff than blow up the truck at that point. But that's a moment where you're like they've just they've crossed the line into pure like Joker energy. Yeah. Where they're just like gonna get revenge on the world basically Mm -hmm. Um, well i i really love the scene with the cop too uh um yeah i I find this like that's what this movie everything is doing stuff and it's Uh so good like i love that scene because you you know we're introduced to this cop and he like he he pulls over he's like this really confident strong you know chiseled man (laughs) he's got he's got his sunglasses on (laughs) susan Um, turan and says oh my god it's a nazi (laughs) (laughs) That's so good. Yeah. But then like as soon as he gets the gun pulled on him, like he 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 completely flips, right? And he starts like weeping. And uh-huh. I'm not saying it's I'm not saying it's wrong to weep when someone pulls a gun on you because I mean, I've never had a gun pulled on me, but I assume I would I would probably react very strongly to that, but it's just counter to the way he's holding himself up in the in the moments leading up to that you know like he sees himself as this big strong man um he's a he's a big strong cop and like when he's in control when he has the woman in his control like he's confident and the second he loses that he just turns into a sniveling mess yeah um i I, again so good and then perfect that he's locked in the trunk and it's the, the 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 only black person in the movie i think is the black bicycle rider that uh-huh. finds him and just blows smoke in the, yeah. in the trunk it's perfect um yeah I, it, it's so it's so good everything's everything's working so good in this movie yeah um yeah i mean there's so many great despicable man performances mm-hmm. um there's a uh, i think ryerson <laughs> I, I don't know the actor's name um, um um what is his name oh my god that is why am i blanking on it He's such a pig in this movie. Steven yeah. Toblowski is is the actor's Steven name. Tabl- Tab- yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he's such a despicable piece of shit. Well, it, that, that's what's interesting is like he's they're all they're all different flavors of pig, right? And, and that's what I think is great. Actually, is it makes you realize it, it shoves in your face. Like, isn't it weird that we have like seventy five different flavors of chauvinistic? pig man that, yeah. we, that we all know and are aware of and probably know in our real life it's like that's too many different types of the same type of bad person um mm-hmm. th- like maybe we need to do something about this yeah maybe we should but it's interesting because um, like he he's you know at first you're like oh he's you know he's a cop he's on harvey Keitel's side and harvey Keitel is clearly 
good and then and then you just kind of see that that Tobolowski is is totally doesn't care about the women at all like yeah ju- it, he's just doing his job he's just trying to get the the collar mm-hmm. so yeah it's it's great seeing like the gulf spread between the two of them and, and by the end of the movie like they're just yeah. on opposite sides of this whole thing yeah. yeah um my favorite line read of the entire movie by the way is when gina davis gets back in the car after putting the cop in the truck and like gets in there reloads she i think she's reloading her her revolver while she's saying this and she just goes i know it's crazy but i just feel like i got a knack for this shit (laughs) it's just so good it's the perfect like the way she says it i did not do it justice at all but the way she says it it's so perfectly delivered and it's just like oh my god gina davis you are the fucking queen you're so good at this yeah that's one thing i was noticing is with one exception everybody in the movie does really perfect southern dialect who could um, that exception be matt um that exception is uh uh, uh harvey Keitel who uh, new, new yorker harvey Keitel. New, new yorker trying to do a southern <laughs> twang and and that's and i, and I, I specifically say dialect though because it's not like they're just doing an accent like the, mm-hmm. the dialogue mm-hmm. is is it's bent around the way that southern people actually talk which is not just with a twang like mm-hmm like there's different there's whole different vocabulary of slang and it's just it's very it's very good except for except for extremely extremely <laughs> new yorker harvey Keitel. I, I i feel bad for him because i feel like at some point in the process of this movie he was probably like ridley can i just not do <laughs> yeah. that accent can i just like, not be from here no <laughs> no yeah uh, R- was... ridley's probably like you all sound the same to me anyway yeah yeah it's uh man it's 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 not good it's the only it's the only complaint i have about this movie we haven't talked about brad pitt very much yeah besides somehow like being completely fucking ripped at at a time (laughs) when it wasn't cool to be ripped that way Uh you know like 91 is really pre all men are like super fucking ripped in movies Uh you know and yet that dude has a fucking six pack yeah and he looks like he hasn't had water in three weeks. Yeah, he he has the perfect underwear model physique. I mean, I think I I actually think Brad Pitt is just very genetically gifted and has has like just a body that likes to sit at um four percent body fat. Yeah. Um, because he he what? Yeah, he's just always he's just the the, the whole nineties is just him being in really good shape. <laughs> just incredible shape so i mean i don't know maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm underselling how much exercise he actually did but i'm sure he does a lot but i just it's just like that kind of like seeing with a shirt off fits in 2022 where every single uh male star is expected to be cut like that and it just wasn't as much of a thing in the 90s yeah i mean it's uh, so so here's i I think there's an interesting (laughs) um we're 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 going into male physique territory um (laughs) We're so, male. We're 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 gazing at men. That's perfect doing, for this movie. Yeah, the male gaze at the at at men. At men. <laughs> so so like the thing is, Brad Pitt has always had a perfect body, um, <laughs> and 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 that's just genetics. Like he just that's it's like he has a beautiful face. He has mm-hmm. a beautiful body. It's just true, and not every man has a beautiful body. And so in film when you're an actor you think to yourself more or less correctly like well i don't have a naturally beautiful body but i can make my body look good if i just work out a ton and you know get big chest big big lats and then and then starve myself and don't drink any water when i'm in front of the camera and then i look cut which is not the same thing as having a naturally beautiful underwear model body at all totally it's but you it's 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 it sort of tricks us, and so there's th- that's that's why it has now become popular to just get really jacked, um, is is because it like covers for the fact that there's there's only so many Brad Pitts in the world. <laughs> this is my greater theory of of why everyone gets jacked now. It's because they're insecure. I uh, you're probably right. You're probably right. I I have I have nothing to add to that. I it's not that I disagree, but I, I it's I have no idea. I have no idea um it's wild it's absolutely wild yeah it's worth commenting upon yeah but he's i think he's actually interestingly enough one of the most insidious bad guys yeah because he's the the the, you know the the baby-faced man who's gonna 
like be incredibly kind to you while still fucking you over completely. Yeah. Um, and then like, like you see, like he, he, of course he steals the money. Um, and then he runs into Thelma's husband and is just like, just as much of a creep as anyone else is, where he's mm-hmm. like, I like your wife. Like just, to, yeah. just to be ugh. like, I, I, it's so interesting because like, I, I was incredibly nervous the entire time he was on screen because you just you're just waiting for him to fuck her over like mm-hmm. you just like know where this is heading but like even so like he's being really nice to her right yeah. like like that's the that's the most insidious part of it is like he's like lur- like he and he even kind of tells her what he's doing mm-hmm. when when he's talking about the bank robberies when he's like you know you just find the place and you just scope it out for a while and and learn mm-hmm. the patterns and and the weaknesses that you can exploit and that's like exactly what he's doing to her yeah um and it's just uh it's yeah. the, wor- the worst kind, I think. Yeah, he, he manipulated his way into it. And I mean, yeah, I, I think that's the sleaziest thing about it is like he probably had a genuinely great time, you know, seducing yeah. her and and probably doesn't feel bad about it at all. Uh, so do you think do you think he came in there knowing she had a bunch of money and he was going to rob her? Or do you think he just wanted to bang someone and then also notice the money on the bedside table and grab I've, I've gone back and forth since watching the movie i i think i think my first reaction was it was opportunistic he he, he saw the money and that's just his nature mm-hmm. and then the more i think about it especially with what you just said this idea that what he actually did with them was you know he scoped them out he got a sense of them he waited until thelma was by herself and kind of identified her as the one that he could probably manipulate yeah. And, um, you know, maybe he even knew they had the money somehow. Maybe if I rewatched the movie, there's like some moment when he becomes aware that they have a lot of money or maybe I he just guessed. I'm trying to remember. I know she goes in there. No. Yeah. Because he meets Michael Madsen and that's after they got the money. So he does know. Yeah. Um, because the other weird thing is, how does he know where they're staying? He must he must have just overheard it. Because. They, yeah. He leaves. He leaves not long after they get the money, and so he must have just overheard. And and she never Maybe. stops and questions that. Yeah, yeah. He must have. I mean, the fact that he knows what room to go to is suspicious in and yeah. of itself. Yeah, um, definitely. It, not only that, like they overheard talking about which hotel they were staying at, but he either overheard or like just scoped out. Yeah. Which room? And yeah, and you're you're absolutely right. Waited until he knew Louise was not there anymore because he he detected her as the weak weaker one of of the two, or at least the most exploitable one of the yeah. two. I think the irony is that uh, Thelma is perceived as the weaker one of the two, but ends up being <laughs> yeah. fucking total badass. Yeah, well, he, she. I mean, he he kind of already had the signals that he could definitely sleep with her. So yeah. so yeah. he was just gonna do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. what a creep fucking brad pitt you're no good brad 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 man <laughs> yeah i wonder wonder how that guy's career is gonna go from here no nah, i don't think it's going anywhere yeah man. i mean he's Maybe. just kind of a pretty boy you know it's kind of yeah he'll just be like an underwear model yeah. uh, and that's that's yeah. about it flash in the pan um i guess the last thing i want to talk about with you is i love i love the look of this movie in general but like the vistas it's beautiful right like choosing to i don't know where they shot this i think they're in they're supposed to be in new mexico and Arizona, but that looks like Montana to me. <laughs> so, I, like, I don't, I don't know. What do you think? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I haven't traveled um, to any of the places you just named. Um, well, I think like the monument, like the the monument. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's like the the, the place that all the westerns go, where you have these huge uh, plateaus and, yeah. and bluffs, and I think that's in Montana. Okay. So I think it just like looks like quintessential American West. And so they just use that for everything. Yeah. Um, but I think so. I mean, as you say, it's, it's beautiful. This is classic Ridley Scott actually is being mm-hmm. like, why, why would I care what part of America we're actually filming in? The point yeah. is to evoke a certain feeling. Um, and, uh, and yeah. I think it, it accomplishes that. Yeah. Um, one of the last things I'll say is I love the way their wardrobe changes over the course of the movie. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they start off with um, Gina Davis and this this very pretty white dress she's wearing. Um, Louise is wearing like a hair wrap thing yeah. to cover her head. And then by the end of it, like they're in like cut off denim 
Um, and and like like it's just like it's it, the the wardrobe perfectly matches their character change throughout the movie. Yeah, yeah, I, that's that's a great point, and that's one of those things where I didn't actually notice that. Now that you pointed it out, it's it was working on you subconsciously. Mm-hmm. It's great. And they're also wearing less makeup. Like they're very, very makeup heavy at the start of the movie. Um, and they, for, I mean, for, for obvious, like logical logistical yeah. reasons, right. They're on the run. They don't have time to look pretty <laughs> and wear makeup and stuff. But I think it just also does fit the transformation of the characters throughout the course of the movie. Yeah. There's, there's this beat throughout where Luis will, will like look in the rear view mirror and look at herself and, and kind mm-hmm. of like fuss with her hair. And, and then usually like, give kind of a, a sigh of like frustration and and I and it's interesting because there's not like a movie a moment in the movie that like explains that it's like well yeah that good you don't want that kind of thing explained it's just an interesting character beat where I, I think there's a mixture of of you know maybe she feels like she's she's aging but also I think she has complicated feelings about wanting to look pretty in the first place because like sure that's that just lures these shitty predatory men mm-hmm. and I, I don't know I, I that's I actually liked that because it, it it invited you to think about like what is she thinking right now as she's as she's looking at herself in the mirror you know totally totally I love that that's a great point so I guess I guess the, the place to end with this is with Ridley Scott and you know this is his seventh movie um this is not the first movie that I think has very specifically targeted the complex relationship between men and women and the power imbalances structurally in those things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say that's a pretty actually common theme, at least throughout these early um, Ridley Scott movies. Like I think there's definitely a lot of an alien um, blade runner, the the complex relationship Decker has with uh, uh, what's her name. I forgot. Um, Replicant. Gosh, yeah. That, that woman, uh-huh. <laughs> And maybe it shows the the complex relationship I have where I don't even remember her name. Um, but I, I think this is a Ridley Scott, Rachel, you know, yeah. Rachel. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, like he's like the, the person who helped create the character of Ripley. Um, and then he, he goes on to explore this and, you know, spoilers for movies to come. But I think this is something that he is going to continue to explore is this the way women interact with a society that that devalues them or dismisses them i'm thinking a lot of gi jane right now um which is a movie specifically doing that exact thing as well um but this is obviously something that interests him quite a lot um yeah and it's worth worth thinking about at least yeah yeah there there are there are a good number of um of women protagonists or at least highly prominent i mean i still haven't seen the last duel but I'm pretty sure the last duel also fits the bill. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then of course, you know, the duelists was, was not about women specifically, but again, talking about men and, yeah. and the ways in which men are dumb men, and bad men being ridiculous. And then also, yeah. I mean, and also like, I, I think the women characters in that movie are actually fleshed out in a way where they might not be in someone else's vision of that movie. Totally. Um, and I think someone to watch over me for all its flaws does have one incredible female character that yeah. we wish the whole movie was about. Right. Yeah. The, the one, the one who should have been the protagonist, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think this is something Scott is, is interested in and, and not, not to the point that like every one of his movies is going to be about this, but certainly even in the movies that aren't specifically about this, I think he, he, he sprinkles those ideas into it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even Gladiator has some of that in it, you know, with um, with wow, it's been too long since I've seen the, Gladiator. Yeah, the the Commodus's, you know, sister. Yeah, and, and how and and how she is forced to operate and exist in this world yeah. in which no one gives a shit about her. Yeah, really, if, she, if she'd been a man, you know, totally, right. yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah, kind of, kind yeah. of a well, I was, I was gonna say kind of like Cersei Lannister, but <laughs> but different, <laughs> but to defi- definitely different. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I definitely need to consider that and keep that as we move through these movies. Cause I think it's just definitely a, a, a pretty solid through line of, of all Ridley Scott's films. Yeah. Unfortunately from the Oscar winning Thelma and Louise from here, we are heading next to a movie called 1492 conquest of paradise. This is Ridley Scott's 1992 film about Christopher Columbus and the discovery of the new world. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that a movie 
that is released in 92 about Christopher Columbus is not going to have aged too well <laughs> into our uh, into our 30 year later minds. We'll see. Um, and I also am a little bit worried that there's a reason that neither of us have ever seen this movie. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not shocking that the, the the ones we've never even heard of are the ones that we have not enjoyed mm-hmm. that much. It does um, see the return of Sigourney Weaver working with Ridley Scott, though. Well, that's something. I don't know how much she's in it, but uh, but I I I, th- I think we're almost out of the the valley. <laughs> I think so. I think this is really the last. This this might be like you know the last little rise as you climb out, climb out. You know, like uh-huh. you got to go over one more difficult pull ups place, and then you're out. And I think this is it because right. yeah, from here, from here we move into a lot of really fun stuff. Yeah. Um, not stuff that I, I think will you know, universally love. I think white squall is a movie. I, I definitely saw, uh-huh. I don't remember a lot of it, but um, it's got Jeff Bridges in it. So, you know, I, I'm looking at the poster. I see a lot of shirtless men. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> that, it's funny how, how much the theme of gender is kind of jumping out to me now that I'm, glancing oh, yeah. over these movie titles and being like yeah that was in there that was in there yeah the only thing i remember about white squall is it is one of the most quintessentially 90s movies ever because it has scott wolf and jeremy sisto in it who are, oh and ryan Phillippe. yeah oh my god this is such a 90s movie okay all right scott wolf is like i don't think he's made a movie um since the 90s ended because he was just two 90s okay well you don't even know who this is do you i don't did you ever awesome. see uh, the Double Dragon movie? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and I looked at the picture the white and one. I recognize this guy now. He's yeah. the white one, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. He's so... because he. The reason I think he's 90s is because he was in Party of Five, which was if you were a, a, a teen girl in the 90s, you probably watched that movie because my sister... Or that show. My sister was obsessed with that yeah. show. No, he, he just yeah. has the white... He, he just has that face. You know, he just has that, 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 that 90s face. Yeah, yeah, he has that 90s white kid face for yeah. sure <laughs> yeah uh but anyway first we've got to get through 1492 yeah and learn about columbus sailing the ocean blue yeah all right <laughs> they better work that into the movie i'll be really disappointed and yeah if, if they don't if they don't say those words in the movie then yeah. you know why bother i'm watching a show called uh we own the city uh-huh. on on hbo uh-huh. um a show about how police are terrible uh-huh. um which has been a really fun experience especially this week uh-huh. but um in one of the episodes one of the characters said we own the city <laughs> and i just i just turned to my wife and i said he said it yeah he said the title yeah. i'm just so tired of all these star wars yeah <laughs> i wish all movie isn't there a twitter that does that that just rewrites quotes it, as if all movie titles are said in their movies right. there must be i mean i feel like i've seen that meme kind of everywhere yeah all right so that is ridley scott and his seventh film can't wait to get past 1492 to what's next yeah okay matt let's talk about star wars so like i said uh there was a article in vanity fair last week between um kathleen kennedy and and the uh anthony bresnikin was the the writer who gave the interview and to be honest with you matt this was a, a puff piece article not to speak anything against the writer but like the whole point of this was to like like play up star Wars. Um, but the thing that's really interesting about this to me is a lot of the article is about how Disney and, and Lucasfilm and, and Kathleen Kennedy herself are expanding what star Wars is. And by that, I mean, not making movies anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, they've kind of publicly announced that, that any star Wars film is on hiatus and like, I don't know. I think this is worth talking about because when Lucasfilm was bought by Disney and or at least with these, when they got star Wars, like they announced like a billion movies. Like if you look at like the track record of how many movies have been announced, like Ryan Johnson is supposed to be making his own trilogy. Benioff and vice are, I think making their own trilogy. Um, uh, there was supposed to be a rogue squadron movie. Like they've announced so many movies and like none of them are happening now. Mm hmm. And and yet, as we sit here and talk, we're on the eve of the Obi Wan show hitting Disney Plus, and it, so it seems like it seems like what has happened is Disney, as a company, has kind of decided to pivot towards their streaming model in general, mm-hmm. and Star Wars is kind of like 
the thing that they're doing with that. And, and I mean, you can say that Marvel is doing the same thing, but Marvel also still has giant blockbuster theater releases every few months as well. Um, and it's just, I, I guess, what's your opinion on Star Wars just not existing in movie space anymore? I, I guess I'd have to think a bit more about it to get a, a real solid take, but it does strike me that when you just look objectively and, and you know remove any sort of like fan bias from it, it seems like the the MCU was this incredible home run, you know, grand slam uh, accomplishment in terms of making money. Uh, and and like <laughs> and, and also getting like mind share and just having a whole bunch of people be like, yeah, I'll go see whatever, whatever Marvel movie you put out, I'll go see it. Um, a whole bunch of people, mm-hmm. and then and then Star Wars simultaneously took the most beloved property of all time and and made a lot of its most diehard fans be like, I'm never gonna see any of these Disney Star Wars abominations. Um, and so from, from the perspective of just pure business, I can imagine them being like, all right, we're not going to, but we're going to let the cash cow, we're going to let the, we're going to let the goose continue to lay golden eggs, which is the MCU. And then we're going to take the one that we screwed up and we're going to, to, to monetize that by putting that on our streaming platform. And then all of the people who do like star Wars are going to stick on our streaming platform. Um, that's, that's the most sense that I can make of it. I can tell you personally, I didn't watch Mandalorian. I know. Sorry. I watched the Mandalorian. I didn't watch the book of Boba Fett. Um, I'm, I have not seen anything about the Obi-Wan show that actually makes me all that interested, which is surprising to me because (laughs) I thought that I would be, but then I watched the trailers and I'm like, I'm not, none of this looks exciting or fun to me. Yeah. Um I don't know. Do you have a do you have an overarching theory? Um I guess like I I I take your point and I think it's a good one that you know they obviously, you know, whether you like any of the Disney Star Wars movies or not, it, it is undeniably true that they have been divisive, you know, like that 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 if you looked at their attempt at doing a sequel trilogy, you would call it a failure. Um and and I very much enjoy the last Jedi. I think that's a very good movie. I think it's one of my favorite star Wars movies. Um, but regardless it overall, it was a failure. And, and so, you know, you have this machine that wants to pump out more and more and more of these things. I think you're right that like when the machine is looking at, at one of its gears is clearly broken and they don't quite know how to fix it. The idea that, Oh, there's another machine over here. And actually, this thing would fit perfectly in that machine and and maybe it takes some of the pressure off of us. I think I think Star Wars as a TV series is living in this this kind of have your cake and eat it too world where because it's not a movie they get to play in a way th- that the pressure is not on. You know like like it, it, there's there's a much bigger difference between making episode 9 and making a story about some random Mandalorian Mm -hmm. or, or a prequel about um, Obi-Wan or a a Boba Fett show. Like, it's just like the, the expectations and, and the seriousness with which your mega fans take these things. I just think it's like so different. Mm -hmm. And I completely understand a company looking at this and saying, why would we want to continue to operate in the space where every single film we release is going to be dissected and ripped apart and, and told and explained why this doesn't fit with star Wars canon or why I hate this thing or why Disney has ruined this thing and blah, 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 blah. When we can just make TV shows. And then most people are just going to probably like the TV shows. And even if they don't like the TV shows, it's not a big deal because we, we live in this world in which TV is bigger and arguably more culturally important than movies. And yet it still retains this, this, uh, flavor of, Oh, it's just TV. Yeah. I like that idea. I mean, I I think that makes sense. I, part of me is like, they made a big tactical mistake from the, from the jump with the movies and they could have done the same thing, you know, okay, let, let me, let me set out my argument. Um, it, the tactical mistake was basically them saying, oh yeah, we're going to soft reboot the, uh, the Star Wars tri- trilogy. Mm-hmm. And, and what, and what, uh, and all that really did is it, 
invited perpetual comparisons to the original Star Wars trilogy where the new trilogy was found lacking at pretty much every turn by most people mm-hmm. in, in most places. I mean, I, I like the last Jedi as well, but that's one of the three movies, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and the thing is what they did with the Mandalorian was they just said, you know what? Um, Mandalorians are kind of like uh, gunslingers. Let's just make a, a Western. Let's just make a, a classic, uh, what, you know, trope, tropey, tropeful Western, um, we're we're gonna and we're gonna do it Star Wars style and mm-hmm. and 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 it's like wow everybody loves this this is great people actually like it when you tell like an interesting new story and we don't redo the whole chosen one force emperor um, dark cloaked villain thing and like this this has almost no Jedi in it at all and people love it and they should have done that from the beginning instead of immediately going to the thing you know proverbially blowing their load prematurely on the idea of like we're, we're just going to do the star wars it's like no no you, you maybe you could have built up to that like maybe maybe building up to your sort of ultra high stakes combat with the literal clone of the emperor could have been your end game <laughs> you know yeah um i guess the question i have on that is do you think the fans would have tolerated that? Like if Disney buys star Wars and then says, but we're not going to make any movies in the Skywalker saga for a few years. Maybe, I don't know. These people are so hard to read because they get so angry about nothing. Um, So I I don't know, but I I, I, I like that idea. I, I, I don't know either. I suspect that if they had made the first movie, a really good solid, you know, gunslinger film, that could have worked. But then the yeah. thing, like, like I love that the Mandalorian was a TV show, like, because it, it, it was allowed to spread out. Yeah. Um, you I know, you, you get the, you get the Bill Burr episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally agree. And, and yet I am also a little bit worried about the Mandalorian and it's, it's need to kind of veer back into the star Wars canon of it all with, you know, I, I love, yeah. I loved the Luke moment in the show and I also am terrified what it means for the future of the show. I agree. I don't, um, the less, the less Jedi stuff, the better. Like, like when it was just, when it was just Ahsoka, I was like, I was like, neat. Now leave. Yeah. (laughs) Get get out, like get out of the, get out of the story. It was kind of neat to see a lightsaber after kind of not seeing lightsabers, but I, that doesn't mean I want the lightsabers to stick around the whole time. I mean, it's it's the it's the joke that Red Letter Media made, where like the cool thing about the lightsaber is that it's like mystical and 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 like part of that is that you don't see it all that often. Yeah. And then the whole prequel trilogy is just like lightsabers are just like waving around the screen in the background constantly. Yep. yep <laughs> just yep. To- totally oversaturating you. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, and and I do like. I'm of two minds about this because first of all, I love television and I do think TV is a perfect place for star Wars. It's a perfect place to tell these sprawling stories and, and explore different corners of this galaxy in a way that they've never got the opportunity to do. But also I just think the quintessential star Wars experience to me is a big bombastic movie. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't think I will ever stop thinking that. And so I, I hope that we can get back to making the movies because, you know, this is me coming off of the conversation we had last week where I talked about everything everywhere all at once, which is a fucking movie in every way. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing that needs to be seen in the theater. And that's what star Wars is to me that, that, and and I think that's what star Wars will always be to me is these huge events. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I want them to get back to that. So there's a part of me that's a little sad that they've kind of fully committed themselves to these, these to, to star wars being a tv show thing yeah um, i agree I, I you know i just thought of an idea which is the best idea i've ever had i'm putting it out in the universe <laughs> for free okay, okay. for free and, and D- disney be- disney please please hear my hear my prayer okay they're they're listening star wars film directed by gore verbinski oh my god oh my god i mean that's all Hell i have yeah. to say right oh my god that's a that's an incredible idea why <laughs> Is Gore Verbinski in director jail still? That's probably why. Well, but like, I don't give a shit. Get him out of, (laughs) break him out, break him out of director jail and get, okay. I mean, it does, it, unfortunately my idea does require that there be a good script, but the guy made the movie about the chameleon (laughs) and it was amazing. Yeah, this is fantastic. (laughs) I love this. No, you're totally right. Um, 
how do we how do we make this happen? I, I, I we need to campaign. We need to we need to start a uh, petition. <laughs> we need to start a GoFundMe. You know, if I owned a multi billion dollar entertainment company, uh-huh. I would pay interns to just sit in a cubicle all day and listen to entertainment podcasts uh-huh. and steal their ideas. Yeah. So if you're listening, Disney intern seventy three. Um, you know what to do. Yeah. Take credit for this idea. I don't even yeah. want, the, I just want, I just want that movie. I just want a star Wars movie directed by Verbinski. That's all I want. Yeah. I also kind of want to be the intern. That's just as a sit in a cubicle and listen to the <laughs> podcast all day. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess I already do that at home. I'm just also, <laughs> I'm just also doing other work. It's just one of your jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm, I don't know, man, I'm excited. Um, I'm going to try out the Obi-Wan show tomorrow, but I agree with you. I'm not like, super jazzed about it uh they're also like right before we started recording tonight they released uh the trailer for the next star wars show that's coming out this summer called andor which is about cassian andor the character from rogue one that you probably have forgotten about already (sighs) yeah i mean i mean i mean it could be good but but they they certainly haven't sold me on it you know it's such an interesting choice and, and it feels like something that's left over from an earlier version of the star wars plan yeah you know which is we're going to make these movies and there's going to be a new star wars movie every year and then tv is going to be the place where we can spin off interesting characters from those movies and they've kind of decided not to do that anymore and yet here's the story about this one off character from a movie that was fine um it's it's really interesting i hope it allows us to get a new angle on this universe uh i'll I'll give it a shot but i don't know it just feels it feels so weird to me that this is the next thing they're doing you know like we do the mandalorian which is not about anyone we knew but is the boba fett armor and then we do a boba fett show and then we do a fucking obi-wan kenobi show and the next it's andor and everyone's (laughs) like who (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i mean i the thing is I actually want like like I would love it if the show, you know, is is just about this this guy, but like you just know that they're gonna have like Princess Leia cameo, sure, and Darth Vader cameo, like <laughs> like you, you just but but you like you could sell me on it if you were like no no we're going off in this other weird direction, yeah, exploring all this other stuff because because I've always thought like the the cool thing you can do with star Wars is, is it's just a, a, a fun excuse to do a kind of space opera, sci-fi anthology show um, or, or series of, of shows that sort of in summation or like an anthology where it's like, here's a story about this sort of character li- li- leading yeah. this sort of life over here. And then here's a totally different thing with no relation to that one. And maybe we'll give you an Easter egg to show that they're in the same universe, but maybe not. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. We'll show a Wookiee and then you'll know yeah. in Star Wars. But they yeah. keep going back to the same well of of like got to literally have Han Solo and, you know, yeah. the Millennium Falcon is in this shot. I'm like, OK. Yeah, I mean, and I agree with you. And, and lest I be uh, misunderstood, I don't think it's a bad thing that they're going to tell a story about a random guy I don't know very well. I'd much rather watch those than an Obi-Wan Kenobi show. I think the, the weird part to me is choosing to kind of frame and center the show on this character Uh like i I don't know i feel like you can let's let's have a show about cassie and Endor in which we like get to learn who they are over the course of the show and like let's call it something else because i i i worry that the show is not going to do well because nobody knows who the fuck that guy like when you watch a show called obi-wan kenobi you know you know what you're getting because it's gonna be about obi-wan kenobi but who the fuck is Cassian Andor? I don't, I'm a Star Wars nerd, and I barely know who that is. Well, this, yeah, I mean, he, he's that's the thing. He, they made him up for Rogue One, yeah, and and like they've made very few actually fun new concepts for the pre, for, for not the pre, for for any of the any of the post Disney stuff. Yeah. So I just and and like he was, he kind of seemed like an unlikable, you know, uh, what's the word antihero? Um, yeah. Which, Again, yeah. I don't know what story they're telling with this guy. And and, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing. But like with an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie or television show, you kind of automatically know, oh, this is Obi-Wan Kenobi when he's in hiding. Right. And so like you automatically know what that is. Right. Yeah. I don't I don't know what I don't know who yeah. Cassian Andor is or what he went through, except for like vague hints at it during Rogue One. And so like. 
the choice to I just I guess I guess the bottom line is here. I disagree with the decision to call the show Andor. Yeah, I, I think they should have called it something right. else, well, and they should be selling it a different way. You know, I, I don't think this would really work, practically speaking. But it would have it would have been fun if it were like the TV shows were always named things like The Mandalorian, The Rebel. You know, <laughs> then you could have like a The Stormtrooper. You know, you could have yeah. a The you know, Kenobi. The yeah, well, see, it does it doesn't really work, but <laughs> you know, The Jedi, right? You could you you could have the Jedi and then it's about Obi Wan, you know. And that wouldn't actually work. It's just I I I think the first thing you said is is the most spot on, which is like it's um it seems like a leftover piece of of a much larger plan that they had. Mm-hmm. And they were like, Well, let's just put all of our chips onto one of these twelve shows we were gonna do. <laughs> um and then for whatever reason they chose that one. I don't know, maybe. What what is this Obi Wan show going to be about, though? I know I, I just no said idea. it's very obvious what it's going to be about, but what is it going to be it, about? I have no idea. It it it's. I mean, look, I think it's actually a bad idea because you know <laughs> how everything has to wind up, uh-huh. and I know. Okay, we we we've talked about this on Stephen King that knowing how things end doesn't necessarily remove the drama, but but it's not it it's not an interesting situation because because he. <laughs> At the end of 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 uh, my my mouth wants to say Return of the King. At the end of Revenge of the Sith, he's living in the desert, and and we know that at the beginning of of A New Hope, he's living in the desert next, uh-huh. next to Luke's house. So everything that happens in the interim has to be meaningless <laughs> by definition. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's going to be some adventure, and he has to fight some Sith that are hunting him. But it's yeah. He's going to save Luke like 47 times. Uh-huh. And of course, Luke never knew about it because he's just going to be like there. But the, I mean, the, <clears throat> the poster, the poster that I'm looking at right now uh-huh. has Ewan McGregor in the foreground, you know, standing there in his Jedi robes with a lightsaber on his belt. And he's transparent. And behind him standing on a cliff is Darth Vader with his lightsaber drawn uh-huh. on, on Tatooine. Yeah. And it's like, well... <laughs> <laughs> they're not gonna nothing's gonna happen in that fight it's uh-huh. just one's gonna they're gonna be like all right good fight i'll yeah. see you in 20 years yeah some more more opportunities for these two to fight again <laughs> which which I, I i feel like it's also gonna damage the timeline which i feel like the biggest one of the biggest problems in star wars is that the timeline's so wonky um in that like you really get the feeling that at the beginning of a new hope they haven't seen each other in in decades and decades you know uh-huh. and now i feel it's like the show is going to build to the fact that they've been like bumping into each other every 10 years and being like <sighs> hey, what's up god Let's fight. you're right god <laughs> damn it oh god that makes me so sad you're totally right it's so it's so annoying it's so annoying every lightsaber fight in the in the original trilogy either ends with somebody dead or somebody horribly maimed mm-hmm and 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 like almost and there's so many lightsaber fights in the other in the other f- properties whatever and they're all just like yep that was cool that was yeah a, that was, we did some flippies yeah and... some flippies and some spinnies and that was neat that was neat everybody yeah i almost i almost felt something not quite though not quite cuz I, I, yeah i think i kind of understand why a writer would want to tackle this thing though and hear me out here i think there is something interesting, the idea of what will Ben Kenobi's reaction be to seeing Anakin in the Vader suit for the first time, right? Because when they drew this character in the beginning, like, uh, let's be honest here, they didn't know Vader was his father yet. Uh-huh, like, right. I know Vader means fa- blah, 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 but like, uh-huh. they didn't actually know that yet. They didn't. Yeah that that they came up with that later. Right. And so they didn't they didn't really they hadn't really fully fleshed out the background of these two characters yet. And so their meeting has weight to it because it's a very good movie. But I understand the temptation of a writer to be like you left this boy that betrayed you and everything you stand for for dead on a on a lava planet. And then you go into hiding and then like suddenly you see this black dressed monster in a suit right Uh and then you learn that that monster in a suit is your old son figure slash friend figure like i i totally understand 
the drama that you could mine from that and and why you would want to do it. Yeah. I just I agree with you that ultimately because it can't do anything it yeah. I, I just don't know how good it's going to be. Yeah, maybe you're right. I mean, it, it is interesting c- because the fact that everything is horribly inconsistent gives you some actual opportunities to be like <laughs> like what like you know, why did Yoda and Obi-Wan just literally hide out and do nothing for t- 20 years and, it, yeah. and it's like, well, maybe you know, you actually humanize Obi-Wan a bit and you can see like he's a person living with immense regret and shame and he feels like this is all he can do, you know? Um, yeah, that, I think you're right. That's something at least. Yeah, I, I I will always continue to love the mental gymnastics that that the third prequel has to do to explain why Luke is living on this desert planet uh-huh. with his real first name and Leia's yeah. become the princess of, and, <laughs> of, of and, an entire planet. And basically his actual biological uncle yeah <laughs> great great place to hide uh-huh. yeah <laughs> oh jesus uh star wars uh-huh. <laughs> i don't know we'll see uh, the show could be very good maybe we'll circle back around to it when uh yeah when it's all said and done and see what we thought of it i always like to leave room for things actually being good because oh yeah oh yeah i would yeah. nothing uh, nothing would make me more happy than yeah. the show being I incredible agree. i agree all right so that is Star Wars. Um, we'll see. Can't wait to watch Andor. <laughs> yeah, it sounds sounds good. <laughs> all right, folks, that is all we have for you this week. If you have any opinions on Ridley Scott, Thelma and Louise or on the state of Star Wars, you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com, our Twitter account at doofmedia or over on our subreddit. That's r slash doofmedia where you will find a thread for this very episode. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to the Doofcast, we encourage you to subscribe and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And if you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge at whatever level makes the most sense for you. There are cool bonus things at every level, including getting to vote in our monthly book club. The vote of, is going on right now because tomorrow, Matt, uh, as we record this today, as you are listening to it, the 27th of May, we will be meeting at 930 p.m. over on our YouTube channel page account i don't know what words are channel page account channel there you go it's channel um to discuss this month's book which is what matt what book is it the terror by dan simmons Um, and it is terror (laughs) (laughs) and by that we mean we both really liked it oh i loved it i loved it but it's the hardest thing to read in the world Uh uh-huh yeah i don't mean like like difficulty wise i mean like i wanted to die uh-huh. seven thousand times yeah you 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 pray you pray that the characters will be granted death but your your prayers are not answered <laughs> they, they are not they are not uh, we'll be talking all about the terror tomorrow at 9 30 on youtube so come hang out with us talk about this great book yeah also please consider rating and reviewing uh the doof cast on apple podcasts every re- review really does help us to get more exposure and introduce new people to the content we make here that's right and that is going to do it for us this week i hope you all have a wonderful memorial day weekend if you live in the states and just a a normal everyday weekend if you do not (laughs) but we will be back next week for a new episode covering the films of ridley scott as we said next week's episode will be about 1492 conquest of paradise we'll see you then And you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.